Good evening. Thank you all for being here at our board meeting tonight. And we'll start with the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There was an executive session prior to this meeting to discuss a legal and personnel matter. This meeting is being recorded by the board secretary. All right, I'm going to start with a roll call. Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Jackson? Here. Mr. Kern? Mr. Micucci? Here. Mr. Akmanowitz? Present. Ms. Weed? I did see her here. Uh, Mr. Reimers? Here. Mr. Spear? Here. Mrs. Mitchell? Here. All right, we're going to move on to our general public comment. I do believe that we did have a few folks signed up. Kate Underwood. Please state your name and area of residence when you get oh, up, please. My name is Kate Underwood, otherwise known as the Rita's Lady, <laughs> um, and I'm from Quakertown. You can go ahead and start. Okay, um, we have a reading program to present to you this evening that is specifically geared towards grades K through five. Um, it works the same as other programs work, like the Pizza Hut and the Applebee's, that sort of thing. So it's based on uh, students being able to log up to four hours if they log their four hours of reading with parental guidance and they sign off on this cute little bookmark. They can bring it into the store. They get a free treat. A lot of familiar faces in the audience. If you do this, this will save you so much money. <laughs> um, if you have a very avid reader who's doing 20 to 30 minutes a night, that's going to add up really fast to the point where you end up with a free kid's ice pretty much every week. Um, it does require the elementary school teachers to be a part of it. Works like any other incentive program. The kids log it down, bring it in, the teacher has to sign off on it, and then you bring it into the store. Um, we would supply these bookmarks for any elementary schools within the district that wanted to participate, so it would be at no cost to you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank I mean, you. it sounds like a great thing. I, this thing sounds like something to present right to the schools, correct? Yes. Thank you. Similar to the Book It program, like when I was a kid, the yeah. Pizza Hut thing. So, yeah. Do you have a question from a board member about adults? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 William Tuzinski. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name correctly. And please state your name and area of residence. William Tuzinski, and I'm a resident of Milford Township, and I'm the president of the Quaker Town Edu Community Education Foundation. I'd like to call Dr. Robert Light and any other board members for the QCEF who are in attendance. We wanted to make a special presentation to Dr. Light because he's a founding member of the QCEF and has been instrumental in a number of our programs, specifically the Anna Neiman Lecture and in the uh, Artist in Residence program, and has served as uh, secretary of the board for a number of years. He was also a member of the school board, past president of the school board, so he's been intimately involved in Quaker Town education for a long time. I'll leave it at that. 40 years. 
40 years. So I'd like to say that's longer than I've been alive, but that would be like. And so what we did was we have a plaque that was made by Mr. Bonsell's Strayer Maker Group over at the middle school. And we want to present it to you in recognition of your service to the QCEF. Thank you. a few words. This is an honor. I thought I had my last hurrah <laughs> several years ago, it's, but they keep on coming, so that's amazing. I appreciate it so much. For the benefit of those who, who don't know, the Quakertown Education Foundation was founded under the leadership of Dr. Scanlon about 15 or 16 years ago, and the purpose of the foundation is to give our, things, our students some th benefits that wouldn't be ordinarily available with the regular uh, budget of the school district. And there's a, a board which is represented here of about a dozen individuals who are, who are volunteers from the community, including uh, members of the administration, teachers, uh, and members of the school board. Ron is the uh, representative of the school board. He does a good job in, uh, in uh, letting you know about what's going on. I've been reading the minutes of the uh, school board and I know that he's uh, been uh, letting you know the things that have been going on. I'd like to give a few things of uh, background ab about the foundation. As I mentioned, it, it was founded uh, originally under the leadership of, uh, of uh, Dr. Scanlon while he was still here about 15 years ago. Uh, we had a similar committee some years before uh, composed of uh, members of teachers from the community, school board members and administrators which we call the Teacher Excellence Committee. That evolved into the Education uh, Foundation. David uh, Tyson, who was a teacher at that time and had actually had been the president of the, of the association, uh, was one of our founding members of the foundation and was a member of that Teacher Excellence uh, Committee. The first major uh, project was the restoration of the Walter Baum uh, paintings. There had been paintings that had been done by Walter Baum, who was a famous uh, painter from the, Ox from the uh, Upper Bucks region, and uh, they had been scattered through the school district. Our first project was to restore them and to build a case uh, so that those who uh, entered the high school would know of our commitment to the arts of the school district. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Jim's, uh, Jim Newcomer uh, initiated the re uh, Artist in Residence program, which bring uh, practicing artists into the school district to interact with our teachers and uh, with, our, uh, uh, with our students. There was a need to bring up-to-date technology to the school district about 10 or 15 years ago, and that was our major project for about six or eight years. Tom Clee, uh, was a member of our board, and uh, Tam, uh, Tom uh, had a, a golf uh, tournament every year, which brought about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. That brought uh, technology to the teachers in the school district. In order to uh, honor the memory of Miss Anna Neiman, who had been a distinguished teacher in the uh, high school, uh, there was an annual speaker in uh, in behalf of the social studies. From the beginning of the foundation, small projects initiated by individual teachers or small groups have been sponsored by the Education uh, Foundation. Some projects have a, a wider scope. Uh, Patricia uh, O'Neill suggested a, uh, that we provide a, uh, a, a reading book uh, to each graduate or each first uh, first grader as they move on to the uh, beyond that. Ron Jackson, who represents the uh, uh, school board, uh, suggested last year that we have some major projects that we that we challenge the people in the school district to that. And Kelly Kramer came up with the idea of providing library materials in the content areas 
for fourth and fifth grade students, which is a wonderful project. Projects of the Education Foundation have been implemented. Uh, we really appreciate the aid of you and, and uh, of Dr. Hoffman and uh, Alessa and, uh, uh, and uh, with Chad Evans. I've enjoyed uh, working with the members of the uh, foundation. Bill has provided some wonderful uh, leadership uh, for us, and I really appreciate uh, this honor. One of our uh, awards was for technology, and it's possible, possibly <laughs> a part of the funding for this uh, came from the foundation. So things do come around very, very well. And again, I appreciate so much the, uh, the recognition that you have, that you've given to me. As an old man, the, this is part of my uh, legacy to the school district. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. Finish it off. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of the administration, I'd like to to, to recognize Dr. Light. I, I would say there's no single one individual in this community, throughout the, since its beginning, that has contributed more than Dr. Light. Most of the members of the board know that he has written the comprehensive history of the school district. I'm, still I'm waiting on volume three. <laughs> oh, <laughs> volume so three so uh, his service to the community as a board member for how many years, sir? On the board for 27 years. And how many years as president? Six years. Six years as president, 27 years on the board. How many years on the foundation? I would say there's no single one person that has contributed more to this school district. So on behalf of the administration, all the adults who work in here each and every day, especially those who've been here for the last 30-some years, they recognize your face everywhere. See you in the community. I enjoy seeing you at the country place, too, you and your wife. Thank you. Candace Titus. Oh, wait, before you do that, sorry. I just wanted to say congratulations um, to everyone who worked on the, the Education Foundation, but a special thanks to Dr. Light. He is not only a friend of mine, but he is a great mentor, and he spends a lot of time whenever I need to to give me so much information. I always poke fun at him. I said, Dr. Light, why would you stay on the school board for 27 years? Are you crazy? <laughs> And I, we just, I'm, I'm totally kidding, mostly. Um, but thank you for all that you do for this community. Um, and, and special thanks to everyone else as well who contributes. All right, you can go ahead. Candace. How you follow that. Uh, uh, my name is Candace Titus from Quakertown Barrow. Um, I know that we typically limit to three minutes for public comments, but at the discretion of the board president, we can go up to five. I would like to ask permission for four minutes for my comment tonight. Thank you. Uh, I have three children in the district, and I'm here to speak on delaying school start times. Our children's mental health depends on sleep. That is not an opinion, it is a scientific fact. Teen suicide, teen substance abuse, and teen car accident statistics are alarming and can no longer be ignored. 
And while sleep deprivation is not the sole cause, it does play a major role. I have read countless studies and articles on this topic, including the entire 104-page State Commission report on the website. The recommendation to delay start times is coming from the State of Pennsylvania Advisory Committee because it is supported by robust research. We can no longer turn a blind eye to the science. Let's be honest, the reason our school start times are what they are now is because of transportation costs. Well, I stand before you today to say that we must no longer put transportation costs above our students' mental health. I implore you to stand up for our kids and make a change. It is obvious to me that the best possible solution is a two-wave transportation system, with both high school and middle school starting around 8, 10 a.m. and elementary remaining the same. Our district prides itself on our new mental health initiatives, as it should. But this is a huge piece of the puzzle that we are missing. Over the past several years, we have put a significant amount of money into a dance studio, a football field, and now we're looking into a baseball field. Each of those investments have only benefited a portion of our students, while an investment in transportation costs to change start times would benefit our entire student body. So I struggle with why we are so resistant to this change. Putting more money into transportation is essentially putting more money into helping our students achieve sound mental health. We must see past the first hurdle of the transportation costs and see the long-term savings of not having sleep-deprived students. Students who are not sleep-deprived are more likely to have less nurse visits, less counselor visits, less absences, less car accidents, less sports injuries. They are less likely to make poor decisions regarding crime and substance abuse. They are more likely to be focused and achieve higher test scores and higher graduation rates. In fact, one study done by the RAND Corporation says that delaying school start times nationwide could contribute $83 billion to the economy within a decade, $9 billion within the first two years. And those who are happier and more successful adults are more likely to decide to raise their families here, thus adding a percentage of that economy boost right back into our own community. I feel that an 8.10 a.m. start is the closest that we can get to the Joint Commission's recommendation of 8.30 without affecting our elementary students. With a two-wave bus system and an 8.10 start for high school and middle school, our elementary school schedule can remain the same and our most vulnerable students can remain unaffected. The American Medical Association says, and I quote, while implementing a delayed school start time can be an emotional and potentially stressful issue for school districts, families, and members of the community, the health benefits far outweigh any potential negative consequences, end quote. Thank you for your time. Lots of claps from the high schoolers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else for general public comment? Okay, I'm going to move to um, the approval of the minutes. Can I get a motion to vote for approval of the minutes? So moved. Second. Um, I believe that was Mr. Jackson and Mr. Spear. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next item of business is the superintendent report. Thank you, ma'am. Um, first off, as those in the audience recognize, we have two uh, Boy Scouts in uniform here tonight. Well, at least one. I think one's in partial uniform. Um, <clears throat> as a former Eagle Scout, I'm calling you out. Is that? Um, are, I know you asked this question one meeting, Dave, uh, about the they were here to po possibly receive some sort of um, service thing, or badge. what is it? Uh, for. for it's, it, I think it's uh, citizenship in the community or communications. Mark. Oh, you are in uniform. I am corrected. Dan, come on up. A 12th grader, come on up here. He's, Dan is a 12th grader in the high school, and I'm going to ask you to talk about your Life Scout. I can see it with your badge, plus you have Valley Forge Trail Medal. I have one of those. I got it in 1969. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. You're up. Talk about what you're doing here tonight about Boy Scouts. Uh, hi, I'm Dan. As 
as me. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm here for my to help work on my citizenship of the community merit badge. It's one of the Eagle required merit badges, and one of the requirements is that you have to attend some sort of public meeting. In this case, a school board meeting. And it's one of the two merit badges left I have to do besides my Eagle project before I can officially send in my paperwork for Eagle Scout. And uh, yeah, is there any questions? What's your Eagle Scout project? Oh. Uh, my, Eagle, my Eagle Scout project is I am going to be repainting the outer walls of the local VFW building near uh, Trinity Lutheran Church and uh, 313. The walls are in not great shape and they definitely need a um, definitely need an update. Yeah, two, two outer walls and I'm also going to be restaining the handicap railing for the building. Wonderful. And what do you do with the high school? Um, well, I'm a high school senior. I am part of the robotics club started by Mr. Polk. Um, currently, right now, we are building a robot to try and compete in the National Robot League, the league that we are part of. We've started our prototypes and like designing um, like our official like sketches and all that before we get straight into building with all the materials. And I would say it's been a lot of fun. As for my classes, I am currently in six AP classes, most notably AP Calculus BC and the new AP Physics C, started last year. Um, well, started this year, actually. Um, they're both, well, all my classes are very difficult, some more so than others, but I, I think I'm keeping ahead and staying afloat. My GPA hasn't tanked too bad yet. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you want to do next year? Um, next year, I plan to be going to college for chemical engineering. Right now, I have been accepted to Penn State main, main campus, and I've also applied to RIT, RPI, and Lafayette. I have yet to hear back from any of them, though. And yeah, after that, I plan to, I'm not entirely sure. I think I might want to get a master's in material science, but I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't know how things will go once I go to college, but ready for the trails that will take me on. Oh, well, thank you, Dan. Thank you. We have Daniel in the back. Daniel is a ninth grader, correct? Yes. So the Daniel, our senior, was set the stage for what to talk about. So it's a, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel Chizinski. Uh, I'm in ninth grade. Um, I'm with Troop 13. I'm a uh, Star Scout, and I'm working for my communication merit badge, which... Uh, well, one of my last requirements is to attend a uh, public meeting, this being the school board meeting. That's the last uh, merit badge I need before I get my life rank. So I'm here to uh, observe, take notes, and kind of have a little personal record of what, uh, what went on. Um, I, I'm in a marching band and uh, indoor track at the high school right now, and uh, it's ninth grade year is going well. I, uh, I'm in the AP uh, Human Geography class and enjoying it and doing well and I'm uh, it's really really all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming Thank tonight. You. Great things ahead for both of our Dan's from the Boy Scouts. Thank you very much for coming to the meeting. Now we have uh, recognitions. First up, Gavin, come on up. Good to see you, buddy. You stand right out there in the center, so everyone turn around. <laughs> turn around. You see, turn, let them see your jacket first. So you can see this. Turn around. There you go. Our number eight here, Gavin uh, Crissetti, right? Is that, is that how you say? Yeah, Crissette. Crissette. You don't put the e at the end. Is if you uh, rec you probably don't recognize him because he normally when you hear his name he has a helmet on and big pads and all that kind of stuff. He is the guy who kicks our extra points or field goals and and kick kickoffs and uh, he has been with us as a starter for at least two years, correct? Three years, three years doing this. Uh, I, I, his statistics he was well check my notes here, but I knew you were first team all league as a place kicker. Your this past year or is this total twenty four of twenty five af uh, point afters? That was just just this year. That's a lot of touchdowns we had too. It's not bad. That's a footnote. A lot of touchdowns. 
Um, George, I know George will watch this sometimes, George Bennis. Um, then six of your nine field goals, and your longest field goal this year is like a professional at 42 yards. So um, I just wanted to congratulate him for being first team all league. Um, I, I watch him on the sidelines. Those who go to football games know I like walking up and down behind the team on the sidelines and always telling him to warm up because he's going out. And uh, he's, he's a fine gentleman and a great football player, and he committed to our program. What are you going to do next? You don't know where. What are, what are you thinking or what are they thinking about you? So Ursinus is Quakertown South, <laughs> since that's where Tommy Garlic is and Vera was, and uh, and who else is there now? Uh, I think might go there next year, Brad Bryan. As I said, Quakertown South, that's it, Ursinus South, or Quakertown South, and, and Ithaca is Quakertown North, and who's up there? Noah Wood, and who else? Um. Yeah, so that's great. Great things. Congratulations. Did Tyler make it? Yes, he did. Returning our junior, Tyler Marworth, first team, all league. You face the crowd, too. No jacket to show that you play football. But uh, this young man uh, is the, probably the fastest runner on the team. He can run anybody down on defense in, uh, as a safety, or what do you call that position out there? It's safety out there. Um, he uh, plays backup quarterback, and he was a running back and wide receiver. He's just um, a man of all positions on the football field. Uh, he had 500 yards rushing this year, and over the last two years, your junior, your sophomore, and your junior year, you have over a thousand yards and sub seven touchdowns. Now, how many is that receiving and uh, or running? You couldn't tell me. You don't keep track of that. I would tell you also, last week, Tyler was selected by his teacher, Lincoln Carr, back in TV production. Last week, he interviewed Senator Mensch back in our TV studio. Senator Mensch was a guest of ours for about four hours last week, and he spent about 30, 45 minutes with Tyler being interviewed. And that, I, <coughs> Has that been posted out there yet? It's out there, and you've got you to tweet me on it so I can share it with the world. But anyway, I'm really proud. Plus, he's coming back next year. Thank you. Maddie, you here? Yes, Maddie. Mom, Dad, they're working at the store. Okay, this is a plug. This is a non-paid political or a commercial announcement. West End Tavern, Mom and Dad. And our receptionist at West End Tavern when we watch playoff games is Maddie. Maddie is first team all league. This is her second consecutive year. District qualifier all three years on, this is for, excuse me, this is for a woman's golf, or for, for golf. I guess it, it, you, you don't differentiate it, correct? Or is it differentiated? It, yeah, you know, during the regular season, she plays by um, with all the guys as member of team, and then individually on the women, she's uh, first team all leg district qualifier last three years, most decorated female golfer in Quaker Town history, and and she is moving on to Westchester University. I knew that. Besides, I didn't need to read that here, but I knew that because you told me when I was in your restaurant the other day. But congratulations um, and best to your parents. Thank you. Now, you, I knew the, um, you can't see this, those are sitting in the chairs up here, but if you turned around, turned around, <laughs> guess who we have coming? Come on up here, ladies. Come on up. It's amazing how slowly you're walking given how fast you can walk out there on the court or on the football field. Now, you're going to line up because you're going to give us one cheer somehow. You got team captains figure that out. Where are our coaches? Okay, there are coaches over there. Sarah, wave a hand. Our, is our head coach, assistant uh, Carrie Maha. You, I don't see Carrie here. And, and then Liz Ebersol. Uh, our two coaches on the end. Ladies, you're going to be able to figure something out and do one quick cheer for us? Because you have a crowd. 
Uh, no, just don't push anyone up in the air because it's going through the drywall. <laughs> Come on, team captain's got to figure it out. Now, no, but as they're figuring it out, let me brag on them. Over the last last year, we our our uh, cheerleaders have inc have progressed in competition in an incredible way over the last my knowledge my last six years here last year you placed first in districts you first in districts um this year you placed third in districts but it's still you know people change in come in and go out and all that kind of stuff it placed 14th in state this year and that's out of all the high schools correct out of all the high schools you're only talking 700 some high schools 14th out of 700 some high schools that's pretty darn awesome and they qualified for nationals in Florida when is that in two weeks, in two weeks. okay well I know they work 24 7 because when I leave the high school at night from competition or go in there for something I see you all in the in the uh, sixth grade center gymnasium working out um, but come on you got to give me something team captains give us something for five seconds here Now, we're not asking them to tumble like they normally do, which they're very good at. But thank you very much, ladies, for coming in and giving us your time. Next up on the superintendent's report is something from Ms. Candace. Uh, you just spoke about start times. Um, I'll hand it off to Ms. Edwards, and I think you have an introduction to do. Okay, good evening. Um, members of the school start time committee have been meeting this fall um, and, and beginning their study of the issue. And while they are by no means done, um, they wanted to come and give an update on their progress to date and um, what they intend their next steps to be as they continue to study the issue and gather community input and prepare to make um, a recommendation to the board um, probably by the end of the year, but no later than um, next fall so that um, whatever the recommendation is could be implemented for the 21-22 school year. So we have some members of the committee here that will speak. Some are hiding in the one, two, three, fourth row back there. So, um, wow, we'll call them out. well, you know, <laughs> they know, those that have served on committees before, they know I'm going to call them out. So, um, so Leanne and Amy, if you would go ahead and update the board on your work so far. Great, sure. Hi, my name is Leanne Stoudemire. I live in Richland Township. <coughs> Amy Harwick. I live in Richland Town Borough. Um, so the boards met, or the committee has met about four times now. Um, what we've done is really look to um, get our own information and little plug for Candace and anybody else who wants to read the 104 page state report. I think you should get Rita's water ice for that. That would be great. Um, it's really, there's a lot of great information in there. So we've started by going over that to inform ourselves and educate ourselves. But then the next step is to educate the community. We've done that by creating this one page um, so, there we go. Our one page, um, one page um, information uh, pamphlet. That's our flyer. That's also on the website, which has been created. Um, this has information. Just Candace kind of went over it all for me in her four minutes. Um, you know, just some of the benefits to students. Um, it also includes some of the issues that we are that common concerns that you hear, which is what are the, the financial costs in terms of busing? What are some of the other things to consider? Um, child care comes up as one, athletics and things like that. Um, 
just trying to read what we have on there. Uh, some of us did attend the forum um, by Bucks County IU where they discussed school start times. Um, we also uh, attended the presentation by members from the state school start time committee where they did an overview of the report, which was very nice. We didn't have to read all 104 pages. Um, so that was helpful. And there are several of us that will be attending the presentation at Penridge High School. Um, I believe that's next Tuesday. Um, let me see here. Um, so, like I said, we've, we've been educating ourselves, attempting to educate the community. We do have a website. We also have an email where we um, can receive input from the community. And looking at the feedback, it's about 50% split right now. Some people that are all for it, others that have their reservations about it, but it's been a great way for us to get more information as we move forward. Um, we've developed, spent a lot of time developing a survey that we're going to present to both students and to the community so that we do get more feedback as to what the concerns might be if we do look to make this change and then our next steps would be to um, start to outline some possible ideas of how this might um, happen there's numerous ways of, as we've learned from other school districts how they're doing it. Um, it it doesn't you know we could start at 8 10 and it might not necessarily mean we need to move the whole day back that hour and 10 minutes um, there's just a, a whole variety of possibilities we could keep a two-tier bus system possibly or keep the three-tier bus system or move to a two-tier bus system so um, again we'll really take all that information from the survey which we're looking forward to having because it's a, it's certainly going to affect the entire community so having people um, give us their feedback from the community is going to be helpful um, at this point we don't have a recommendation from the board because we don't have information other than to um, you know allow us to continue as a committee to look through um, there are a lot of other districts that are looking into this Penridge I believe is doing a two-year study um, a lot of other uh, districts in Bucks County who have been able to get information from and share information from um, we're also looking to get um, data and information from districts that have made the change so we can see you know after they've implemented this after the first year how does it benefit their students their communities and maybe what issues have they run into um, okay. Good. Yeah. covered everything any any questions for us I was gonna ask the question about which uh, first thank you thank you all for the amount of work that you're putting into this it's very much appreciated um, volunteering your time it's very important that you all are, you know, looking into this to give the board an idea. Um, and I've read, you know, the science on this, and I know that there are some challenges associated with it. I, I feel it, it, it makes sense. But from, um, I, I'm glad that you all included, I was going to ask, some districts I'm noticing are doing, they're <clears throat> staying at the three tier, and then others are, are only, um, doing the two so and this may not be a question for you all maybe a question for you know our administration um if we did a two-tier system do we know if that would mean that we would not need as many buses on the second tier um a two a two-tier system it would, would would require about 12 to 15 more buses yeah uh, we're we're talking about a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars more. Isn't that right? A ballpark, Zach? Yeah, have you looked at that? Go ahead. We haven't done any formal analysis because uh, we were waiting for it to go through the committee, but I did work with Levy just to get some estimates, and you're looking in the you know, $500,000 range, yes. And I just, that's every year. And that's every year. I was going to make that point as well because that's important. It's not just a one-time cost. Um, I'm just wondering though from 6 to 12 do we have more students collectively in 6 to 12th grade than we do to K to 5 or is it about does it is that about the same do we does anyone Ms. Edwards, do you talk about that since you're the enrollment um, person I was counting on my fig fingers how many grade levels were <laughs> K to um, K to 5 I do think that the work of the redistricting committee and whatever um, recommendations they make about grade level configurations will also dovetail with this committee's work which is another reason why they're going to do further study um, because so many things could impact 21-22 um, so that could have a an impact on how many buses for example if sixth grade whether it's still a building or whether it's you know whatever it is if it if it operates on the elementary schedule then does that impact how many buses are needed so um, I, I think all that will it's a good point 
Yeah. yeah. Just something I was thinking about because that would be an interesting challenge if you, I'm just giving numbers, if you needed 50 buses from 6 to 12, but you only needed, you know, 30, obviously that's a low number. But just, just throwing that out there is something that would be an interesting mm -hmm. point. I don't know how you'd solve for that. But something, something I want to point out, given the little hi, uh, handout we just received, something that I hope, I'm, I'm sure the committee is considering this, but one of the schools that is highlighted at the bottom of the first page of the sheet is Radnor, Delaware County, and there we're on the forefront of changing start times. And we've heard the literature quoted today. We've all seen it in the past, and the magic number is 830. It's interesting to note, though, that the middle school of that school district starts at 750. So I'm not about to discuss the science. I'm not about to get into anything in that regard. I trust that for whatever reason that is the case, our committee is looking at switching grade levels for start times as well. Correct. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So I feel a little stupid because I read the whole thing and I didn't know there was a summary out there that <laughs> gave me like a Cliff <laughs> Notes version. Um, but you had mentioned about getting a 50-50 feedback. What, what were some of the uh, negative feedbacks that you were getting? Um, Childcare typically tends to be the number one feedback. Um, so if you switch start times for when you have older students that might have provided childcare to younger students who come home, if the... Um, Older, the younger, you know, older students are starting later and um, ending later than who's watching the kids in the afternoon. Um, question about athletics, I think, would be the next um, biggest question. Um, those would be the negatives that I've heard. I'm not sure if you. I've seen a lot of people. Just I don't know if you saw the article that the morning call did. They came to our last committee meeting and they did an article, and so I was following comments on there, and a lot of them weren't even from our our community, but just a lot of comments. People seem to think that we're doing it to make their life easier, like just to make things easier on them and kind of co like co comments were, you know, like, oh, well, when they have to go to work and get a job, you know, they're gonna have to get up early. And I just think it's important that people understand it's not that it's just there's science behind it and there's there's reasons why. I mean, having come off the safety committee, a large part of the safety committee was focused on mental health. Well, you can't say safety is important and mental health is important and then not look at at all of the reasons so for me I think people just need to take the time to read the research which is why we did this summary so that you know every when we want everybody's input because it is going to impact everybody differently but just so everybody understands why we're considering it yeah I would any, go ahead no, I mean I think the, the research is pretty clear and I think you know when you, when you look at the, the science behind it you know the performance sort of uh, equals that to intoxication um, when you when you talk about sleep deprivation and there's been studies that looked at um, you know sleep beyond one hour two hours you know akin to one or two alcohol drinks um, and that number goes so it's equally as dangerous um, for the mind uh, so I I agree that it's and and we're not on the edge. this has been around for three, four, five years. I mean, there's been pro a lot of private schools that have done this mm -hmm. way there's, ahead yeah, of it. California made it a state thing. So, right. I mean, so. it's not just. Well, that's the good news is there is there are outcomes out there. And so I think for people um, out in the community, especially those maybe hesitant to get on board with something like this, is to show some of the outcomes that some of these places that have done this for a long time. Because, yeah, it may be a little bit of a pain to say, hey, your child care situation, but look at all of these other upsides. So, any other comments? Thanks again. Really appreciate you all. I just all. wanted to add in terms of the start times, too. It was hard to, there's there's really no other schools around us that have changed. And even if there were, when it's hard to find a school district that has the same demographic. So you can't quite compare and say, well, they've done it. So if Penn Ridge does it, why shouldn't we? Because it's the, the busing, all that stuff is so different. So that's some of the challenge in looking at the schools and the different start times. And even just looking at Radnor, where we've talked, where they don't, and I think they, they don't bus their students or they, they bus very few of their students. Um, 
Um, and that's the, the challenge is there's no, yes, as close to 8.30 as you can get is good, but from the state committee, um, they said, you know, everybody does it different. It might be that there's just more traffic around that time, so having students st pushing the start time back to then doesn't make any sense because they're just going to be riding the bus longer. So it's really about <laughs> how taking what the feedback we get from the community and looking what the best fit option for Quaker Town would be, um, despite what other districts are doing. One thing I was thinking about when we did it before was that athletics was a problem because no one else was doing it. So kids got to athletics, other schools way late, or if other schools came here, they were waiting for an hour, Great. you know, whatever, that kind of thing. So that's just one other thing. It'd be better if everybody did it all together, it, obviously. It absolutely would, yes. We've talked about that. It would be great if everybody did it at the same time. And it feels like, you know, the kind of consensus is that maybe one district sort of waiting for the other one to just take the plunge and we'll all fall in line. But I think it's great that we're, you know, on board with everyone else and just really looking into it and gathering as much information as we can. So thank you for allowing us to do that. Thanks. Thank I, I did notice, too, that... It, there may not be many districts that have done it yet, but many districts are doing the same thing we are. They all have committees. They're all studying it, all the local ones. So hopefully we won't be alone. No. So what would be the impact then if we did it, but let's say Penridge didn't or or something like that? What would tech be the school. impact for well, the, the, tech the, the school? The first, the, like the first and most there. important one would be for our uh, four to 500 students to go out to the tech school every day and the, the time there when i first got there our students were missing about 25 minutes this is six years ago before when high school started around eight o'clock and middle school was at 7 15. um and then we had the snow that was six feet high because it didn't melt for a month and a half and we switched start times by fixing those start times where we're at right now we're even with penridge school district and palisades is off by a few minutes out there tech school but our students were losing tens of hours of instruction out at the tech school because and they therefore not getting certified in some of the areas that other districts students were so that's the number one issue if we launched into it right now mm -hmm. and speaking every month at the superintendent's meeting or monthly meeting at the iu there's 13 school districts in the county and i also consider and talk to the superintendent satterton upper perk southern lehigh about what they're doing because a lot of the employees we share teachers we share bus drivers you know they all come from different places so you have to consider a lot of that and i think we're all going to move in a big leap together because next year is the big study year for most of the other districts we're ahead of them a little bit by about six months so i think we'll have a good solution if you have the patience to to see what we do by fall most importantly penridge and palisades thank you Thank you, ladies. Thank you for dedicating all your time to the community and all your research. Uh, next up on the superintendent's report is goal number one, domain number one, culture for teaching and learning. The most important thing, the most important reason we exist as a school district is to improve student achievement through high quality of instruction and our domain number one is culture for teaching and learning to develop consistently reinforce a pot of positive culture for learning at the classroom building district and community level and then part of that this year one of our uh, domains and our objectives is increasing ownership and effective use of student and building level data and we're in year three of that as a part of our continuing series of of school building reports to the board report out and presentations to the board this is our third presented by Quakertown Elementary School and without further ado principal Dr. Michael Zakin is up and his teachers uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, madam president and all the members of the board uh, as well as uh, Dr. Harner and the district uh, office leadership team for having us here tonight to present on uh, data-driven instruction. Um, as Dr. Harner said, I am uh, Michael Zakin, the uh, proud principal of Quakertown Elementary School, uh, as uh, commonly referred to as QE. And uh, before we get started, I'd, I'd like to paint a picture of uh, QE and knowing the students, uh, the community we serve impacts how and what data we use to inform instruction. And as you know, like, like all the schools in our organization, QE is a special place. And one of the attributes that makes QE such a special place is that we're primarily a walking school. There's such an incredible sense of community at QE. 
Tonight, we hope to tell our story, discuss with you the data we use, how we use the data, uh, which we take very seriously, and share with you the processes and systems we have in place to make data-informed and student-informed decisions. <coughs> but before we get into it, I would be remiss if I didn't briefly review some of the unmeasurables that impact the measurables. As we all know, data is important, and there are so many additional things, people, events, and, uh, and more that impact student performance. And some of you were here for uh, the presentation in September when I presented on uh, QE Summer Slam and our Summer Literacy Initiative. Um, a few other examples of those events that impact the measurables that are, in, that are not measurable are you can see on the pictures behind you or on the, the presentation. Our Literacy Night or Literacy Nights, <coughs> our Bingos for Benefit, we have a QE Under the Lights, our annual costume parade, Winter Wonderland, our family service night with a special shout out and thank you to the district level leadership team that helped get that uh, organized and off the ground. We have a annual LLC or, or excuse me, a Leukemia Lymphoma Society LLS fundraiser for childhood cancer. We have a summer ice cream social I'm just going to leave this picture here for a minute. <laughs> we have a diversity day or celebration of cultures at Quaker Town Elementary School every year. I like those shorts. <laughs> and I'd also have to highlight two people that, as well that impact the, the measurables, and that's uh, the heartbeats of our school or the heartbeat of our school, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Detweiler and Mr. Dibler. Here's a general overview of what we're going to cover tonight and what uh, wonderful, the wonderful staff members and teaching team will. However, in addition to what you hear tonight, there are many more sources of data that we use daily to inform instruction. However, I've been told to be brief, and we don't want to be here till midnight, so we're going to limit it to the sources of data you see behind you or uh, on the screen. At this time, I'd like to introduce the teacher team and their role, and they will start the presentation. So Mrs. Eileen Bruchak, our school counselor. <laughs> Mrs. Karen Groller and Mrs. Jane Germani, reading specialists. Mr. Jeff Palin, instructional coach and intervention specialist. Mrs. Carrie Foley, our ELD specialist. And last but not least, Mr. Wayne, one of our fifth grade teachers, a science, social studies, and WIND teacher. And with that being said, we're going to get started and jump right in. We're talking about QE Pride and our PBIS program with Mrs. Eileen Bruchak. Good evening, thank you for having us. Positive Behavior Interventions and Support, or PBIS, is an example of a school-wide multi-tiered system of support centered on social behavior. Students need to know what is expected of them at school so that they can have the academic and social skills that they need to succeed. Students are explicitly taught and recognized for exhibiting pride expectations. Pride at QE stands for perseverance, respect, in control, dependability, and effort. In your folders is our Pride Expectations, which is the Pride Matrix, as well as our Pride Pledge, which is said daily. And on Fridays, our special Pride song is sung. We use data-driven, problem-solving framework to improve outcomes for all students. We evaluate data such as attendance, office discipline referrals, and it's a constant cycle of improvement, school-wide as well as for individual students. We evaluate the data, we plan for solution development, and we implement action plans. From this continuous cycle of evaluating, planning, and implementing, our solution development has led to the following creative interventions, as seen on the screen. So our pride recess is something that we implemented, which is structured student-led games. Our pride pals is our student leadership team. And then we also have added additional staff members to our PBIS team, as well as a parent member. We revised our matrix for our pride language, and we also have created and implemented new PBIS lesson plans, as well as small group interventions. The next slide is our office discipline referral data. 
The triangle to the left is the typical percentages per tier. The green tier is tier, the green is tier two, tier one, the yellow is tier two, and the red is tier three. The middle triangle is last year's school's data, and the triangle to the right is our current office discipline referral for the school year. As you can see, 93.6% of our students have either zero or one office discipline referrals. So what we are doing is working for a large percentage of our population at this time. Tier one, the green supports, serve as the foundation for all behavior and academics. Tier two supports is for groups of students with targeted needs, and tier three is our most intensive supports for school, uh, for students. The reason that they are the most intensive is that they are more individualized um, and developing and carrying out those interventions. In the next few weeks, we will be analyzing universal screener data, screener data for additional tier two interventions. It is a district goal to implement tier two for PBIS. Examples of tier two interventions are check-in, check-out systems, small group interventions, and behavior contracts. Next, I would like to introduce Mrs. Karen Groller, who will talk about another school-wide program, our Title I program. As Mrs. Bruchak stated, we're a school-wide Title I building. Title I programs are uh, designed to help children meet the state standards. Once a building reaches 40% poverty, it's eligible to become a school-wide Title I building in which the entire school will receive the support of the program. A requirement of being school-wide Title I is the development of a comprehensive plan with the input of staff and parents. The plan includes a needs assessment in which we take a data walkthrough. We look at PSSA, Dibbles, NWA, and Panorama data. That leads us to the identification of school accomplishments, concerns. We develop a goal and then an action plan. QE's goal is to ensure that we have a plan to analyze data to promote improvement and growth. Our strategy for improvement is professional development. The implementation steps, you can see them on the slide. They're, they give us the opportunities we have to engage in the professional development. One of our top professional development topics this year is data analysis. Teachers have attended before school trainings on understanding our M-Class system, which houses our Dibbles data, as well as learning how to administer the assessments for progress monitoring. We meet bi-weekly to analyze the, the trends. We look at individual student progress, and if we're making the progress that we hope to see, will continue as is. If we're not making the progress, we look to make changes. Some examples of the changes that we've already made this year, we might review or reteach sounds or sound combinations in words. We might change a target skill focus in a small group. And we've also added many supplemental activities to build fluency. So here's our work so far. This slide compares our school-wide beginning of the year composite scores, which is the top line, to our middle of year bottom line composite scores. The composite score is going to reflect the different literacy skill subtests that each student takes. In your folder, you'll find an explanation of all the Dibbles subtests. So as a building, we are very proud of the following. We increase in the well above benchmark composite scores, which is the blue, by eight students. We increase at, at benchmark, which is green, by 25 students. And we decrease our well below benchmark, which is the red, by 32 students. This table narrows down our data a step further into grade levels. It's important to note that the composite score indicates a student's probability of achieving subsequent early literacy skills and does not indicate a grade level proficiency. We know we have areas to celebrate and we know we have areas to work on. Whether the per percentages for each grade level have increased or decreased, our work is not done. We will continuously need to help our students work towards acquiring the skills needed to reach the next literacy goal. 
So we'll continue to progress monitor, we'll continue to analyze the data, and we'll continue to make changes to our instruction as necessary. I'd like to introduce Mr. Jeff Palin. All right, good evening. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk about um, two different assessments that we do um, in addition to the, the Dibbles reading assessments that Mrs. Grohler was talking about. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is our Dibbles math assessment, which is taken by all of our kindergarten and first grade students. It is a tool that we use to predict future success in mathematics. It is taken at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. It's assessed individually, and it measures the following skills. It measures students' ability to identify numbers, uh, follow number patterns, <coughs> compare numbers, uh, engage in one-to-one -one correspondence activities, and also do some basic computation with addition and subtraction. You'll notice substantial growth in both full-day kindergarten and first grade. Mm -hmm. We had a slight drop in the percentages for our half-day kindergarten students due to the following factors. Uh, first of all, this group of students came into the year very high, as 74% were at or above benchmark. And when this is the case, it is more difficult for them to show substantial growth from the beginning to the middle of the year. Additionally, the expectation tripled from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. At the beginning of the year, students needed a composite score of 24 to be considered proficient, and now they need a score of 72. So even though the overall percentage of students in green and blue <laughs> went down slightly, the class still made significant growth when looking at their overall performance. We use this Dibbles data and the skills addressed to supplement our Eureka Math program. We are working to develop numeracy groups during our flex days, which is a way to provide students with engaging teacher-led centers to promote number awareness. We plan to run these centers once every two weeks and make adjustments to the expectations as students get into more challenging content as they move throughout the year. So the other assessment I'm going to talk about is our NWEA assessment. The NWEA assessments are used in third through fifth grade and in second grade, uh, but just for math. The assessments are taken at the beginning, middle, and end of the year and cover reading, language, math, and science. These tests are adaptive, and as students get problems correct or incorrect, it will adjust the level of difficulty as the test progresses. Here are the results for QE. The percentages indicate the percent of students <laughs> who either met the achievement goal and or made the targeted growth as they moved from the fall to the winter assessment. Teachers use these results to make instructional decisions, group students, and identify students that may need more individualized support in a certain skill area. Mr. Wien will talk about this more in depth later in the presentation. Now I'm going to introduce Mrs. Foley, who is going to talk about our ELD program. Hi. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to start with a map. Um, and the stars are where all of our students are from. Our EL students are from all around the globe, um, from China to parts of Africa to El Salvador to Mexico, many countries. Um, and we're very, very proud of that. Um, our cultural diversity adds so much richness to our school community. Um, and we also are proud that we are the first building that ever had English language learners. Um, I think I'm going back 20 years, so I'm dating myself. But um, we were the first building to have it. And when you were, even when you lived in a neighborhood where you were supposed to go to a different elementary school, you were bused to our school so that you could get the service. Um, now it's no longer like that. All the buildings have um, English language as a program. Um, but we're just proud to say that. Um, but I say this because our teachers are very knowledgeable and have a wealth of experience with these type of learners, um, which really is so, so incredibly helpful. Um, we, it, it's very common for us to get kindergartners coming in. Um, we have two this year. It's at least one since I've been there um, who speak no English at all. 
Um, it's not uncommon for us to get a first grader, second grader, third grader, fourth grader, fifth grader um, who come in speaking no English. Um, and we teach them the same content that we teach the other kids. Um, but our teachers, they know strategies and they have magical ways to, um, to get them where they need to be. Um, we currently have a kindergartner who is from the Dominican Republic. She came in knowing no English at all, um, and now we can have a conversation with her. She understands most of what we're saying. She knows all of her letters and sounds. Um, we have a fifth grader where English is her fourth language, um, and she came to the district in third grade, came to QE in fourth grade, and she's already exited from the program. So she learned it in that amount of time. So we have some amazing kids, um, and we're, we're so thankful for that. Um, the next slide, sorry. So in terms of assessment, we give our kids the same assessments that everybody else has, but one that is unique to us is called the WIDA Access Test. This is a state test that is given every year. Um, we give it in January or February, and I'm giving it actually right now, and we get the results in June. So what's up on the screen is a student sample, so that's a report that we get in June. We send that home. Um, it goes in their native language, and we also bring parents in and explain it to them so that they have an understanding of what they're looking at. Um, I share this with teachers in the beginning of the school year, so they have a starting point for the kids and they know where their strengths and their weaknesses are. Um, and we also share it with the kids so that they can set goals for that year for themselves. These are the WIDA scores from 2019. Um, oh, and I did not say that the WIDA test them on listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So they get tested on all four of those domains. And the points go from 1.0 being the very beginning to 6.0 where they're ready to exit or they sound like a native speaker. Um, and if you can see, I have the grade levels on the left-hand side and then the scores across the top. Um, and I highlighted where the majority of the students fell at each grade level. And as you can see there, it's a really nice picture of how they're progressing as they go through the grade levels. Um, I work with the English learners do, during win time. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to Ryan Weand, who's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Good evening. Uh, for the past two years, I've had a unique uh, position and schedule at QE because our fourth and fifth grade classes have been three deep for those years, which allowed me to departmentalize uh, sci and teach science and social studies only. Uh, when I'm not teaching three uh, science or social studies classes, 60-minute classes, I teach a 30-minute uh, block of time called WIN. And WIN stands for what I need, not what I need, but what my students uh, need. <laughs> Uh, during that time, um, I'm spending it primarily on data-driven content literacy. So I'm taking the skills and the concepts that our RELA teacher is teaching in her class, and I'm applying it to my class with science and social studies articles and nonfiction reading. Also during the 30 minutes, uh, our English learners, our reading support students, and our learning support students are being pulled out so they're receiving what they need in small group settings. Uh, none of this would, be, would work unless I was able to collaborate with my uh, RELA grade level partner. And we uh, collaborate a lot on the curriculum itself so that I can understand the specific skills that she's teaching the students in her class. And then I basically follow up behind and circle back, and I reinforce those exact same skills in my class. And we will use the exact same anchor charts and organizers and terminology that are being used in the wit and wisdom curriculum. Um, I have those posters and materials in my, my classroom as well. Uh, in addition to collaborating on the curriculum, we collaborate on the data. And we use the NWA results, PSSA results, and our formative classroom assessments to, to drive my instruction during this time. One uh, primary piece of data that I use is the NWA class report data, which gives me an overall look on how all three of the classes are doing. So it tells me how many students fall under each uh, grading bracket. So for instance, in the fall of this year, we had one student who was in the high level, that's the blue, and in the winter scores, now we have five. So obviously the hope is that the uh, lower and low average uh, brackets 
we're seeing less of those students throughout the year and more above average. On top of that, I'm able to give an overall look to see the mean and median RIT score, which is a scoring system NWA uses for our students, and it gives me a snapshot of how those classes are improving. So I think if I, I say it's okay, we had a 196 mean in the fall and 206 in uh, the winter so far. So it just gives, uh, it validates what we're doing is working between myself and the RELA teacher. I can also look at specifically um, how the students are performing in the informational text, the vocabulary and acquisition, and the, the literature aspects of the, of the test. And finally, another snapshot of data uh, that specifically helps me during wind time and plan for wind time is the NWA learning continuum. Uh, this breaks down the specific skills that the students uh, are being tested on. And uh, on the right side, are, their names are, are uh, blued out there. Uh, but if you look on the left, there's a range of scores. And all of those students are falling within that range. And it tells me the skills that uh, they are working on right now in that range. Uh, a good thing that uh, is good for me is that I can look ahead to the next bracket of scores. And I can see, well, what does it take for these students to, to progress to the next level? And I can add that into my teaching. During wind time, I'm putting my students in small groups, and this allows me to, to, to figure out where are the common needs in groups of students so that I, I can target those needs together. Dr. Zakin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with our last piece of data here on uh, our panorama, and as, as you're probably familiar with the panorama, student survey measures student perceptions of teaching and learning, culture, climate, student experience in the classroom, and school. Uh, students in grades three through five, uh, excuse me, grades three through 12, actually take this, uh, stu this survey. Um, and th the, the survey helps us identify their perceptions of our classrooms and, and how they're feeling and what we can do uh, to be better in those areas. Uh, this slide reflects uh, the most recent panorama student results as we compare to uh, the national averages. And it, you, can, you can see we're in the top quintile, which is something we're incredibly proud of and something we continually work on to be even better at. Um, for a more detailed breakdown, you can see in your folders um, on the, uh, the, the right-hand side that says keep at home pocket, uh, the, uh, the, the full breakdown of our panorama results. We, we want to foster, as Dr. Harner said as a goal, we want to foster a, a, a culture for learning. And what better way to do it than utilizing these re results? And, and the, the, the process looks like teachers looking at them, reflecting on them, analyzing them, identifying areas of strength and areas of growth. And uh, the Panorama platform uh, has, a, uh, has a, a very nice playbook that, that our teachers utilize, identify uh, specific strategies that they can, they can implement to, uh, to improve. And it's part of our goal setting process. And just one more slide here. This reflects a longitudinal student survey data from the fall of 2015 to, to current 2019. It shows uh, classroom teacher student relationships. Um, you can see our results have changed over time from when we start. We first started uh, using the survey. Uh, 88, this slide, 88% of our students reflect a favorable rating or a favorable student to teacher relationship overall. Um, and if anything is going to validate the immeasurables, the impact immeasurables, it's this. And uh, this is one domain, and the other, the other four domains reflect uh, something similar. All this could not be done without all of your support the district level leadership team support, um, and dedicated people of QA. Um, if I could, uh, if I could acknowledge the members of QE that are here, who, who bring these slides to life every day, could you please rise? <laughs> None of this would be possible without them, and without the people behind me, without your support, without their support. And with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Mrs. Germani for the, the final piece. Well, speaking of student perception, um, we put together a video with the help of the students to show what QE means to them. QE is more than this productive work environment. It's a place where students can be themselves. They grow as learners and individuals and where relationships are made every day. QE, QE is a safe and welcoming place where, all, um, where we invite all and celebrate all learners. Thank you. This is 
what Kiwi means to us. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to share share uh, information and, data and how we use data to inform instruction at QE. We'd be happy to entertain any questions at this time. I, I have a quick question. Uh, he had mentioned that the Dibble standards had changed and based, basically tripled um, over the course of uh, the year. And that popped to me, of course, because when you move the goalpost, uh, that makes the game a lot harder. And the stats still look good, by the way. Um, Thank Why you. did that happen? Could anybody tell me? That's, yeah, I can feel that. Yeah. So essentially with our, with our math dibbles as well as our reading dibbles, basically the bar is raised as students move throughout the year as they're acquiring these skills. So at the beginning of the year, coming into kindergarten, uh, the bar was a lot lower than it is at the middle of the year. Uh, as far as identifying numbers, number patterns, and things like that, you know, students should be more... Um, able to do that with with more fluency, so that's that's how that um, why that expectation. Was so the score is like based on a benchmark of sorts that is moving. Uh, yes. Throughout. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Yep. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, is there? Um, you know, we had. I mean, we see this kind of the same trend um, when you look at. Uh, we had another. I think it was. Uh, I'm trying to think if it was Nidig, um where we saw the all-day kindergarten versus the mm -hmm. half-day kindergarten. Yeah, that was Nidig. Um, yeah, it was Nidig. We saw this sort of the same trend where, you know, <laughs> it looks like the all-day kindergarten are, are sort of outperforming the half-day kindergarten. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. I think the baseline for where our students are coming in in full-day kindergarten versus half-day kindergarten um, is uh, I think it's fair to say that they are all they are all uh, have a lot more growth and room for growth than the half day kindergarten. Yeah. Point that out the board. I, I had a question too about the uh, ESL program there. Do you have, when you have a, a student come in from, you know, I see you on your map here, you had like Kenya and Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you handle that when you don't have a translator necessarily on staff that can speak that I language? I was wondering the same. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of technology, which is really great. Um, so Google Translate helps us a lot. Um, we had a, a student who spoke French who came in last year um, in second grade. And fortunately, that fifth grader I was talking about, she speaks French. So we were like, come on down. <laughs> um, so it's a lot of visuals um, in the beginning. Um, you know, it, they have little cards with pictures on them. They need to go to the bathroom. Like we first do like things that they have to know right away. You know, we start with those kinds of things to get them going. Um, but you wouldn't believe how quickly they start to pick it up. It's and, really and what happened to Saudi Arabia and uh, Iraq on your map? They don't seem to be there. No, <laughs> oh, no. no we don't have anybody from there. <laughs> oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, the text. It, you, it's there. It's there. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> I, I would. I would also, as as part of the, our Title One, uh, our Title One school-wide plan, we we have a transition plan for new students, with 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 uh, 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 A to Z in terms of of uh, acclimating them to, to QA you know, with, with, with a meet and greet tours um, and, and then with Mrs. Foley as well as Mrs. Mrs. Frank, Frank's help, uh, um, we, we, uh, we, we get them up to speed with, uh, with what they need as, as soon as we possibly can.
Any Thank other you questions? Guys. No, I just want to say, you know, my son is a student at QE and he absolutely loves it. Like he loves going to school there. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you all. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you, sir. For you teachers Thank you. and Thank you. building administration that normally don't come to these meetings and for coming out this evening and using your time for us. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the great presentation. Um, lots of great information. We don't always get exposed to as board members. So it's great to see what happens behind the scenes. Thank you very much. The last part of the superintendent's report, I'm gonna, I know the board has asked me to spend more time reading this, but since I'm, I request that I be forgiven tonight, this one night, because I have a, a bad cold, and we are uh, used up a lot of time during the superintendent's report and other presentations. One hour. I've been coached back here by Coach <laughs> Micucci. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, if you would take some time to read the report, it's published there in the board docs. Thank you. Thank you, and I think I think I mentioned this during um, the retreat. We had a retreat. Was I supposed to say that earlier in the yes. meeting? Yeah, we had a retreat. Um, when was that? About a week ago. <coughs> Two Mondays Last ago. Last Monday. It was only a week ago. It was. It was only a week ago. Um, so we're trying to figure out the structure of how we want to do these superintendent reports, and we're thinking somewhere along the lines of. We love these presentations as they come in, and we also want to get updates on the goals, so we're, we're working that out. But great presentation. Thank but, you. But the only thing I, with my voice can't handle, I like to celebrate one of our significant goals, is Martin Luther King Day. Yes. We had a lot of great stuff going on across the school district and outside the school district boundary. Our, our, um, it was really a lot of fun. We let our adults who, were, who are um, both te teachers that it was a... Uh, not teacher, not a teacher work day. A lot of teachers gave it their personal time. Then there were others that, uh, on our staff up here in the district office, they they asked to participate, going out to food kitchens and other places, and to do volunteer work. So it's all in the report. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda is our student report. Jake Burton, take it away. Um, so I'm going to start off, um, I, I was here in, I can't remember if it was September or October, um, but I'll, I'll start off with the personal points and then I'll get to the district as a whole at the end. Um, so personally, since uh, we last met, I was accepted to UVA, um, which is my number one choice, so I was really happy about that. Uh, I plan to major in history and then minor in studio art and photography and then go somewhere for education post-grad. Um, and I really want to thank... Um, two people in particular and then a group of people. Um, so Mr. Mackey, uh, Mr. Detweiler, and then the guidance office, um, they really helped me out with this process um, through recommendations and, 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 and obviously guidance. Um, it, without their help, I, I really don't know how I, I would have gotten here. Um, I, I'm just, I'm very appreciative for what they've done. Um, and with Mr. Mackey as a teacher and Mr. Detweiler with his, um, with his help through course selection and things like that throughout the years. Um, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I'm very, very excited for the next four years to go who's. Um, and so um, for NHS, uh, it will be the next point. Um, we, over, around Christmas break, uh, we were selling, uh, Kelly, we were selling candy grams and um, and so Mr. Birch, uh, the one of the advisors, um, led a group of about like 20 or so kids and so we paraded around the high school in our in our costumes and everything handing out the candy grams and uh, that was a really fun experience and uh, we also have winter ball coming up on February 8th um, a couple Saturdays from now um, so the plans are getting going on that um, so NHS definitely getting the ball rolling excited for that. Um, for journalism, I am currently taking journalism uh, again with Mr. Birch, um, and I, I just I love being able to voice my opinion about things that I'm passionate about. Um, the thing that I the, the most recent article that I published uh, was a review on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um, the Quentin Tarantino movie from over the summer. Um, and I'm really passionate about that movie and a lot of other things that I've written about, and I'm just very happy to have that outlet because um, this is my first year in journalism, and I'm thinking because I'm a big photographer next year at UVA potentially. Um, potentially using that um, and, and joining the, uh, the journalism club at UVA um, and using my photography skills to good use. Um, so that's, that's been awesome. I, I really think um, journalism is something worthwhile for, um, for the district to emphasize because I, I, I think it's a great opportunity to have that student voice. Um, and I know a lot of kids, um, a lot of kids don't really know about it or like 
don't have a ton of information about it, but I think if, if, if we got the word out, I think a lot of students would join it and um, with kind of that advertising towards it, I, I think it, would, it could really take off. Um, but I think it's awesome so far. And, um, and the fact that we've just moved to all web, uh, last year we, like, there were actual paper copies that were handed around the school, um, but this is the first year that it's, it's all online. Um, so I think that could, that could uh, be a big opportunity to, to really spread uh, the newspaper. Um, I also mentioned last time that I was here that I am uh, one of the co-chairs of Student Forum, which is the, um, the student-led um, organization between all the districts in Bucks County. Uh, we all meet at a different school every month, um, and we discuss different issues. We're in subcommittees, and so the subcommittees are uh, mental health, social justice, environmental sustainability, uh, vape prevention, youth gambling, uh, and I believe there's one more. I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, we, we break into subcommittees and we talk about student issues, um, what's working in schools, what's not working in schools, and I think it's an excellent opportunity, um, again, to, to, to exchange those ideas, um, and like you were talking about with like the, um, the start time and like hearing from other schools, it, it's just, it's, it's really interesting hearing other, other schools' opinions on different, different issues, especially for high schoolers, um, because you can relate. Um, so that's been, that's been spectacular, and I'm really happy that, <laughs> really happy with the IU, um, and Mr. Roland, Mr. Ron Roland in particular, um, with helping out. And uh, Quakertown will actually be hosting for the first time, and I, th I think ever, um, next, uh, in a couple weeks from now. So February 19th, uh, we'll be hosting at the high school, and Dr. Hunter, I hope you got uh, Mr. Soto's email about potentially coming to talk about the district during student forum. But that is beside the point. I'm sure I'll be there. Um, but yeah, I, I think student forum's awesome, and I, I, I think if we if we really prioritize that as well, um, it really it just it's a good exchange of ideas. Um, and so, as for the district. Um, the wrestling team is doing incredibly well right now. Uh, I went to take pictures at the Quakertown Duels, I'd say two weeks ago, and I was taking pictures for journalism. And I know a lot of kids on the wrestling team, and I know the two managers pretty well. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. And, and they were they were pouring their, heart, their hearts out there on the on the mat, um, and they were doing awesome. It was really cool seeing the wrestling team succeed. Um, and I, I used to wrestle back when I was in like kindergarten and first grade. But it was just like it was cool seeing like it, you know after pouring that. And a lot of the kids that I that I uh, that I saw out there were kids that I wrestled with or against um, as, a, as a little kid um, back when I was in elementary school. So it was really cool seeing them perform at, at the highest level, um, some as seniors in high school. So that was, that was awesome. And the reason <laughs> I was going to go to the, uh, the duels meet at Westchester right now, but I, I was like, oh man, I can't go because of the board meeting. But I, I hope they're doing well right now at Westchester because I know they have a big, um, a big meet there right now. It was, um, they won 68 to 9. I think it's I think it's a duels match. So I th it was I, against Reston High School, okay. the number bottom seed. We were number one seed in District One. They're which doing is well. Just basically, southeast Pennsylvania. Yeah, but it, it's been really cool seeing them do well. Um, and then I, I was I actually forgot to put in my notes, but MLK Day. Um, have you mentioned that uh, the speakers for back to back years have been awesome? Um, it's Miss Miss Jackson was was a speaker last meeting, um, and. I don't know. There's just like just the way that they can like control a crowd and and really like emphasize their points. Um, Miss Jackson was discussing her um, her experiences as like a five year old in elementary school, how she was like pushed to the ground, like bloodied, beaten during recess, and it was kind of it was kind of gruesome. But she was using it to prove the point that um, those experiences and the experience of her elementary school teacher, uh, some of them have left, but just the fact that um, having that development in elementary school to to teach. Um, morality and to teach that acceptance is such an important part of life. Um, she said that she remembers um, being, I believe it was either kindergarten or first grade, um, where they would sit in a circle and have like a story time and her teacher like kind of like wrapped around her to show her that um, even though she might be excluded during recess and other activities, um, she was a part of class during that moment. And she said that, that moment has stuck with her for a long time. Um, so, you know, just having that experience with, with Miss Jackson and her, um, and her speech was it was it was awesome to hear, um, and again back to back years that this, the speaker was really good, um, and so I went to Phoebe Richland and we were just enjoying our time with with the old folks. Um, I love going to Phoebe because I, I help out with with VFW um, and we handed out blankets and um, different. Uh, it was like a, a gift package to all the veterans there. So I, I know some of the people at, at, at Phoebe. So it was nice seeing them again and, and being able to volunteer and, and play some games with them and um, just go out in the community and, and connect. Um, so that was awesome. And I know a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of kids in, in my, a lot of seniors um, went to that event. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited um, in the future just to see where MLK Day goes, having just implemented it last year. I think it's it, it will really take off um, as, it, as it just keeps developing. Um, and having that leadership with, uh, with Ms. Fuller and a lot of other people, a lot of other teachers um, devoting their personal time to, to put that all together. So I, th I think it'll really take off. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see where that ends up going. Um, and then the last two topics I want to talk about are uh, school start times and then vaping. So the last time I was here, I, again, I talked about vaping. And I think, unfortunately, I think the issue has almost become worse, um, at least in bathrooms. Like, bathrooms are, like, the key point. Like, I... I can almost, I'd say probably 75% of the time that I have to go to the bathroom, like, I'm always like, oh boy, like, there's going to be another group of jewelers in the bathroom, and it's, it's just like, oh, it's not, like, affecting me in just the fact that it's like a, it's like a convenience issue, like, they're, all the stalls are taken up and, and things like that, and it just, like, takes away class time from me having to go to, like, I might have to go to another bathroom to, to use a stall or whatever, and it's just, it's just frustrating because, um, you know, like, these, like, these kids, like they, they feel like they're on the top of the world and they're doing these things and some don't even realize like what they're actually doing to themselves and it's really like it's really worrisome and I think it's it's besides not like uh, social media addiction I think it's probably like a close to in terms of issues for my generation um, so I, I think it's definitely something to to keep emphasizing as I know we've had a lot of um, a lot of meetings and speakers come in for the high school um, and yeah so I, my lunch table is right in front of the the Q pack. And so, like, we see kids having to stream into that bathroom all the time because we're right, we're right in front of it. And it's gotten to the point now where um, during lunch, like, they have to lock... And it's only the boys' bathroom, really, because they're mostly the culprits. Um, they have to lock the boys' bathroom during lunch. And so I, I have to walk, in, like, from the Q pack all the way to the front of the school to have to go to the bathroom. And it's, again, it's just a convenience issue, but it's just like frustrating because you know these kids are like they don't realize like what they're doing to themselves, and it's it's just it's just frustrating. Um, but again, education is the key to hopefully fix all of this. So I, I hope with time and um, and and more and more meetings and things like this that that the problems um, get fixed because it's it's like it's just heartbreaking to see what they're doing to themselves. Um, and then second of all, uh, school start times. Um, again, coming coming from a senior high school. Obviously, like that eight ten would definitely help. Like having that one hour sleep. Like I understand. I understand. There's there are obviously other issues at hand, but like coming from a senior high school, that that one hour would would absolutely help. Um, because I, I, I luckily first period I have a field study, um, and so it's not like I, I jump right into my day. Like I'm able to to kind of uh, as a field study. Like I, I'm working and I'm working hand in hand with with Mr. Anderson to teach um, AP World History. Um, but it's not like I'm jumping straight into like my calc class first period. Um, so because if I jumped into calc first period, I don't know. Like you were saying before, I don't know if my brain would be able to handle it. Like my brain capacity might not be quite there for for first period. Um, but definitely for um, for for high schoolers, it's it's definitely um, an important issue. And I know we we talk about it a lot. Um, just coming into school and everybody's everybody looks drained. Um, and you just come in, you're like, oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm tired. And it's um, and there's really there's really not much we can do except just come in and kind of grit our teeth and hope hope that we end up doing well in our first period classes in particular. Um, and it obviously gets better through the day as we kind of wake up. But um, a lot of kids have coffee and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I just know um, coming from somebody who um, who's had to wake up at you know 5:30 every morning um, since freshman year. It's it's just luckily like I. I don't really have that like that drowsiness that a lot of other people do. I kind of come in and I, I just get right to work. I, there's just something in my brain that works a little bit better than others, thank God. But um, I know some people like really get get um, hit hard by that seven ten. Um, and sometimes I I just kind of wake up and I'm like, oh, it's seven ten. But sometimes over the weekend, like I wake up at like ten thirty and I'm like, wow, like I have to go to school during seven ten in the morning. And it's just like a really it's it's crazy to see. Uh, the juxtaposition between how we are over the weekend and how we are um, during the week with the drowsiness and everything. Um, but on a positive note, there are a lot of good things going on in the district, um, especially with our athletics. Again, the wrestling team is awesome. And our involvement in the community, whether it be through the student forum that I mentioned, MLK Day, again, a great opportunity. I think that is only going to keep growing. Um, so I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, and the club involvement with NHS and Key Club, um, and student council. Uh, I, I just, I really like where the clubs in particular are going for the high school. 
Um, excited to see what they end up doing in the community in the next couple of years after I'm gone. But um, yeah, I, I think the district is on the up and up, and yeah, good news here. So thank you for the time. I, I don't. I was I was talking with Mrs. Caseman before. Um, I, I know this time and last time I, I kind of talked a lot. But if you guys have any questions, like for a high school perspective, I've, I'm all ears. Um, definitely willing to answer any. I got a quick one for you. Mm. So the um, that student forum that you do, do you guys um, share your results, like what you come up with, to any school boards or to the IU or? So um, the the subcommittees um, actually make projects, whether that be a PSA, a poster, um, a video. Um, one group that I'm, I'm talking with right now, they're actually thinking of making merchandise and t-shirts. Um, and so they all meet up. So like we present these ideas at, at the last forum meeting, uh, which is uh, sometime in mid to late May. Um, and so we present those, um, those projects to Mr. Rowland. And he, um, he approves them to be shown to um, the superintendents and the principals of the, of, of the districts in the county. Um, and so some like initiatives that you um, that some people might see in in high schools in particular um, come from programs like that, um, and I think this year there's there's some serious potential for projects to to be taken out of student form and implemented because um, some of the ideas are, are really bold, but they are they're very um, they're very achievable. Yeah, I think I, you have a much better perspective on like the vaping issue or the social media issue mm -hmm. too because they're your peers. Yeah, you you know better than any of us do how these people think so yeah but I, I'm really excited to see where our projects end up come uh, where they end up going and um, hopefully um, they end up making it through to Dr. Harner and, and, and Mr. V at the high school um, and end up coming out to the high school students because I think there's some there's some serious potential there good if I may I just want to add uh, at the end of every school year um, Mr. Rowland comes in and presents the final information to the programs and services committee which I'm a member of so I'd be happy to bring that back to the full board um, if you're interested in seeing that in probably June yeah yes. any other questions yeah. congratulations on your first pick thank being you thank you in that's wonderful very insightful the information especially the vaping you know it's a it's a shame um, because I, I I'm as much reading I've been I've been doing about it I, I don't know that fear tactics um, are gonna work it doesn't seem like they have been working some of the consequences different schools have been putting in place um, have really been working so I'm kind of interested I don't know if we do this on at, yet at this level at our uh, district level level do we offer any sort of um, Let's say a student were to come to us is highly addictive, and they said, "Hey, I, I'm really addicted to this. I really want some help." Is that something we promote to students? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Great. And and uh, not to end his report on or downer note, but uh, publicly talk yes, about what happened today that you don't know about. You had a fire drill this morning. <laughs> you had a fire drill this morning at 7:15 when it was minus 12, you know, at 12, 12 degrees outside. It was because the students vaping marijuana in our bathroom. Maybe we should institute like a reward program. If you, no, I'm just kidding. You tell on your friend, and you, they get caught. You get twenty-five dollars. Guarantee you, this vaping problem will be done for. No, I thought you were. And yeah, just Christ. and and for the greater good. <laughs> they were, mm, the, the the students were identified within a, just an hour, mm -hmm. and so they quick. and so they'll be prosecuted, which is sad that they did it, and and unfortunate that they'll be prosecuted. Um, if I could just add one more thing, um, I've seen sort of like like an attitude of um, like rebellion when it comes to like the vaping like kids will kids will go up to if the bathroom is unlocked kids will go in and then like there will be like a pack of like I'm no exaggeration here sometimes like 15 to 30 kids that like walk in at a time and like my lunch table is just sitting there and like we just see like a horde come in I'm like oh man of course there they, there they go and so then you know like an aide will come in and we'll take them out um, but then there's like um, just like an attitude of like rebellion, like it's like a like oh you know like they they just want to do everything they can to like just rebel against the the system, like stick it to the man. It's just it's really weird. Like I you think that they would I don't know. It's just it's kind of worrisome just seeing like that attitude. Like people are are just very 
um, people are very like uptight about it. Um, the people that do, and like whenever they get caught, like they get very like defensive. Um, it's it's not like um, it's not like the people like when they're getting caught, they're like ah, you know, like maybe I should like. Sometimes people are like, ah, I should change my ways. But other times people are just like, oh, like this makes me want to do it more. And just to like, just to show them like, oh, I'm, I'm rebellious. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird reaction. They were up to me, we'd make them clean bathrooms or something that they would really just not look forward to doing. But apparently that's illegal. Yeah, I think, uh, I I just want to put some context around this. And while vaping is, is absolutely an issue, you know, this issue has been going on for as yep. long as there's been high school smoking in the bathrooms um, yeah and as long as there's been teenagers roaming the earth and so um, I remember walking in and people be smoking in the bathroom yeah. and so yeah. I, I would imagine vapes probably a little bit better for the you know byproduct of the person breathing it in you're not actually getting that Hopefully, secondhand yeah. smoke like you were when I was going to school so um, you're right it's 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 horrific but this this will continue and I think um, you know, I mean, we've already put our stake in the ground and, and, and signed on you know, one of the ver- first districts to sign on to a lawsuit uh, against this. I know that there's a lot of work being done from our educators uh, to combat it. Um, and really it comes down to, to sort of peer to peer pressure almost, you know, yeah. uh, just just Positive. not being cool with it. And so um, it stinks. It stinks that you, you know, are exposed to it. Um, but I, I just know, I, I remember being a, stu- a high school student myself, and so. Yep, it's, it, some things never change. It's just, it's, I feel like it's easier to mask the vaping, yeah. and that's what makes it more prevalent. I had to look up the who's, like, the, I'm like, you're, we're you talking about UVA? I'm like, what's that, what the heck is he talking about? But apparently, now I get it, so I learned something new today. Um, thank you so much for your report. All right, we're going to move on to our standing committee reports. Um, do you have a report this time? Because we canceled that last meeting, so. I do not have anything to report for the policy committee other than um, we're switching our meetings um, because Wednesdays did not work for all the committee members. Uh, It looks like Tuesdays may work if they work for Mr. Micucci or no? I was, uh, I was. You're off now? He's he's really not happy with me about that either. You were peeled off? Well, Mr. Kern is not here. I'm on the committee Uh, now. Well, I think Tuesdays worked for John, so um, we may switch it to Tuesdays. For whatever. It's yeah, like if we could get that worked out, maybe yeah. next week. Freshman I think so. I've on. talked to Anita about it, Mrs. Casement, and um, we're going to, I think, switch to uh, to Tuesdays for our policy committee, so they don't um, conflict with other committees. And one of our agenda items that we will start in February, uh, we're going to be reviewing some new draft policies on safety-related issues. So, great. Once we determine those dates, that's Thank it. You. Short report. That's one of the not so fun things about being president is picking committees. I don't, somebody else can do that one. Anyway, we'll reevaluate that next year. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to skip over Mr. McCucci's report. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So, uh, I'm here to give the, the finance uh, update. So, we had our meeting today. Um, <coughs> Some good stuff happening, happening. Uh, so I'll just read through it, and Zach, you know, kind of tag team with me, if you will. Um, so senior citizens tax rebate, I don't know if everybody's heard about this, the administration presented examples of what senior citizens tax rebate might look like. The rebate program mirrors a state rebate program. Some local districts, such as Penn Ridge and North Penn, have recent, recently uh, implemented a similar uh, rebate. Depending on what the district does, a rebate program could cost as little as 40k, um, and if all in, somewhere uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, tonight, at the committee, we just spoke about it. We will revisit this uh, at a later time. Uh, there was a presentation by the auditor, um, the district independent auditor, Barbara Kane Thornton. Uh, presented the results of the 2018-2019 audit. I was very pleased with the audit report. Um, There was uh, a clean audit with no findings. Uh, We reviewed the first look at preliminary costs for medical and prescription coverage. Uh, They presented a first look on the premium increases for medical and prescriptions. Uh, We are a uh, a self-insured program here at uh, uh, in Quakertown. Uh, 
So the total increase uh, was 8.1%, which equates to about 630K. Uh, the district is self-insured. And a premium increase is due to increasing claims that we've had. Um, so just for everybody's knowledge, this was the first look at the increase. Um, there will be two more looks. I do want to highlight one area uh, a, a focus for us, and we'll continue to discuss that, and that's really with our um, our uh, fund. Our uh, Zach, do you want to kind of you know give a little bit? Yeah. So similar to the general fund through the district, we have a fund balance at the consortium level, which has been um, depleted this year. Uh, I have some level of concern with where it's currently at, and if we go into a deficit, it would get wrapped into our future. Uh, year costs. So one of the recommendations I might be making, um, if our second and third look come in lower, uh, we might recommend actually taking the first look or the higher look to take an incremental increase rather than get with hit with a really large one in the future. And that decre decrease was somewhere. So we were, we had a fund balance going in at somewhere north of a half a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. And now we're forty five thousand was 45, the latest uh, so. number. So Something I expected to, to come back up a little bit. But uh, we're, we're definitely watching that trend closely. Um, so good. So results from recent uh, bond refinancing. The results from recent uh, bond uh, refinancing were very positive. The total savings to the district uh, was $444,000 spread out over the next 10 years. And the total, because we refinanced another bond previously, could be somewhere. Yeah, the last one was a little over 800000 So the, the last two refinancings have saved the district over a million dollars. Right. Over the course of the, the remaining number of years on the life of that bond, yeah. Right. Uh, review of projected 2019-2020 expenditures and revenues. Uh, we reviewed uh, the projections of the current year. The projections were created using a combination of data, assumptions, and forecasts. Current projections suggested a surplus of $1.7 million, uh, which would bring the fund balance to just over $24 million. Primary driver for the surplus this year is salary and benefits due to attrition. And then last but not least, and we unfortunately didn't get to much of this, uh, but I, I do want to refer you guys to the um, to the finance uh, section, uh, uh, the agenda from the finance meeting, because a lot of the documents that you had received today are in there. Um, but I, I, I went through them, uh, and we went through them earlier today. Um, but the preliminary budget was presented. Um, the administration reviewed three budgets, so 0% increase, 1.5% increase, and then 3% tax increase. As a reminder, the board doesn't uh, did not opt for exceptions. Um, so the max tax increase could be 3%. There's no formal action needed at the present time. The budget was presented. Uh, presentation was informational only for us. But I do want to ask you guys to go through that as we, uh, as we begin the discussions. Uh, Zach, anything else? Uh, I believe almost every board member was at the finance, so I was going to go over um, some highlights, but I'll keep it much shorter since everybody's already heard it, but just for some of the individuals in the crowd. Um, it is the preliminary budget, so there are still a lot of unknown variables at this time. Um, so it's our best guess with the uh, information we have um, and the assumptions that we're making based on um, our knowledge of our budget, uh, you know, prior years and uh, future forecasting. Um, just to give you some examples, we still don't know what we're going to get in state subsidies. We don't know who's going to resign or retire, uh, the tech school budget. So there's things that are unknown at this time. Um, the total expenditure increase over last year's budget is $4.8 million. However, that's a little misleading because that includes the using the $2 million that we made from selling the school. So in 2018-19, it was a one-time revenue. It's now a one-time expenditure to pay for our nighting bills. So our operational increase is actually $2.8 million, or roughly 2.5% uh, of an increase over last year's budget, which is uh, actually really good for us at, at this time in the budgeting process, the preliminary budget. Um, those cost drivers were the no normal suspects, salaries and benefits. Uh, salaries was about 825000 which includes two new FTEs in that number. Um, benefits, which uh, accounts for um, medical prescription, which uh, Mr. Mikuchi just reviewed, as well as PEASERS uh, is included in that. The Nidig debt service, so the last year of our borrowing, $270,000. 
Um, and then transportation is about 200,000, which is more than we normally see. Uh, and on tonight's agenda is an addendum to extend the contract with Levy School Bus. The reason for that increase, just to remind everybody, uh, we put on the communication <coughs> tools, GPS, two-way communication, uh, and also to try to increase some of our driver rates due to the national uh, driver shortage uh, and then the tech school. Uh, we did present three scenarios, and I'll wrap it up shortly. Uh, 0%, 1.5, and 3. Uh, a 0% uh, uh, results in a operational deficit of 2.3 million. 1.5 is 1.3 million, and 3% is 240,000. Um, just to put that into some level of context, typically when we present the preliminary budget, it's at the full Act 1, um, and that would produce about a 2.3 million deficit or somewhere in that neighborhood. So this year, that's the number at a 0%. So we're, we're at a really good place financially right now. Um, and I just want to have a little caveat. Again, it is the preliminary budget. We're going to continue to work through those numbers. Some of them will change. I don't believe anything will be material, but uh, we'll be presenting every month at financing, uh, the Finance Committee what's changed from the prior month. And I will be presenting a full budget presentation uh, at the next month's uh, board meeting. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on is just some of the future variables that we're considering and you have to think about. Uh, we have two committees, parent committees or uh, community committees, the redistricting, which will convene next year, which could have cost impacts, and then the um, school start time committee, which we just talked about a little bit earlier tonight, could also have cost impacts depending on what those recommendations are. Um, we're currently negotiating with our support staff union. Next year we have negotiations with our teachers union. Um, qualifying for the adjusted Act 1 index, uh, which the Act 1 index this year was 2.6, but due to our adjusted number um, based on our relative wealth compared to the, the state and other districts, we get an adjustment, so we qualify for 3%. Um, we barely qualify for it uh, this year and last year, so um, that could easily just barely dip below 4% and we wouldn't qualify for it um, in future years. And then obviously future economic conditions, which are always an unknown. So that's my quick recap. But next uh, month we'll give the full presentation um, and everything will be posted on our website uh, tomorrow morning. See, I knew what I was doing. You did a great job. It was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I was riveted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Micucci. All right, we're going to move on to our facilities committee, Mr. Spear. Uh, we meet again on February 6th. So I don't have a report for you today. All right. Thank you very much. Next report, and I'll let you do both the um, Bucks County IU, Mr. Jackson, as well as our legislative report. Thank you. Since we seem to have gone over our goal of a 45-minute school board meeting by just a bit, <laughs> I'm going to take a moment for the new board members and to refresh the old board members specifically on what the IU is here for. It's not just special education. Uh, we heard today several times the IU mentioned in other contexts. The student forum is an IU function. Uh, everybody on the administrative team, for the most part, meets monthly or quarterly with their respective counterparts in the other districts down at the IU to talk about trends in their uh, expert areas of expertise. Uh, one of the things I included in the uh, board docs publicly is uh, the services that the IU offers to the school districts for social, emotional wellness, and school safety resources. That is in your board doc. So um, be, you know, be aware that the IU is not just your special education provider. They also offer uh, professional development classes for teachers and a host of other things. So bear that in mind. I included in board docs uh, the board meeting tab. That's a summary of all the items passed at our board meeting, which was just this past Tuesday, and the awesome news, which we used to highlight some of the neat things going on this past month. So that's my IU uh, report. Going into the legislative report, um, I always include on, on the public tab, so I encourage everybody out there who is of that mind to look and see what Harrisburg is doing. Uh, there's interesting things in there. I'm not going to go into them. One of the things I do want to highlight that also was included in your board docs in the public section, um, our past president, Mr. Klein, was fond of commenting on costs we had to incur due to unfunded mandates. And in the board docs is a copy of this document here that the IU put together uh, with several other IUs across the state. 
and it is 40 pages of the state codes that this school and every other school district in the state has to undertake most of them not funded by the state so when people question why are we doing x y or z why does it cost so much to run our school versus some other types of school there's 40 pages of law that harrisburg is happy to say you must do without asking without having us without providing any kind of funding to do it so bear that in mind and please take a time to look at it if you're so inclined mr spear this looks like something's right up your alley here <laughs> uh, that's my uh, legislative report thank you mr jackson all right we're going to move on to the upper bucks county technical school mr akmanowitz Last meeting of the Joint Operating Committee was January 16th. As we do every month, we had uh, an executive committee meeting. Uh, we determined the new schedules for our subcommittee meetings. Uh, that went well. Uh, we were working on a few issues with our new building management company. Additionally, we're working in conjunction with PICO as we are replacing, um, as needed, uh, light bulbs in the school with more efficient LED lights and we're being reimbursed for those LED lights by PICO at almost 100%, if I'm not mistaken. Naturally, uh, we paid some bills, uh, approved some minutes, um, as maintenance issues are mentioned in prior reports were replaced in several policies that are out of date with relevant verbiage. Uh, we needed to put out a to bid a past improvement project once again um, because due to some administrative changes and building changes last year, uh, they didn't get taken care of properly. Um, we reviewed the school lunch debt as per my request. Generally, uh, from year to year, uh, the lunch debt at the tech school, there is little to no rolling balance from year to year, the way things are handled currently. As a side note, uh, there are no Quakertown <laughs> students that eat lunch at the tech school. We passed a motion to secure rebates for some communications and Wi-Fi, hardware, Wi-Fi, uh, hardware, and infrastructure development. We tabled, um, due to time constraints, some discussion on our new video policy we're working on. Uh, we're considering changes in the adult student policy and moving forward uh, donation report uh, thank you Michael Wilson uh, courtesy of Mr. Wilson we have several six thousand dollars worth of oil change kits for Arctic Cat equipment uh, he also donated a one thousand dollar motorcycle Briggs and Stratton um, was kind enough to donate twelve thousand dollars worth of engines that's actually 40 engines for our small engine department and it's fantastic um, and then finally uh, we have a $2,000 donation dedicated to the machining technology uh, by, uh, and I'm going to, excuse me, the Silvery, Sylvine Brasalante Memorial Foundation. So thank you to all those communities, group, uh, community groups and uh, community members for their donations. Some important dates, March 14th, 2020 is the spring breakfast with the bunny. Uh, <coughs> donation report, I did that already. Uh, our next meeting is 220 20. Uh, we will begin at 8 p.m. And finally, uh, on the 29th of January, there's a Skills USA challenge in Allentown. Uh, I'm not going to be attending. I know there will be a luncheon. If any of the board members want to go, uh, please reach out to Jeff or Dr. Harner, who I'm sure will get you in contact. Uh, that concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Mr. Akmanowitz. Did you say your meetings start at 8 p.m.? Yes, we, we, I recently had that changed something. from 7 o'clock. Um, as it turns out, there is a few board members who want a little bit, more, as you know, uh, actually, they want a little bit more flexibility as to attend multiple subcommittee meetings if they want to, because there's so many issues that happen that are so important. Um, we were unable to find consensus on a second evening through the whole month between all of our schedules. And the easiest resolution was we come in earlier, we start later so that we can dedicate more time to the subcommittee, the four subcommittees, which we're going to stack staggering based on um, the size of the agenda so that 
most people can attend most of the meetings while we're there that evening. I see. And that we're going to try our best to have stuff put out there a month before it's actually going to be on the, the agenda. That's great. Does, does that mean the board meeting will be real short since they had the pre-brief? How much shorter would you like them? Mm -hmm. We usually get through those meetings in like 45 minutes. <laughs> it's because of the new president. No doubt. <laughs> oh, yes, because no superintendent report. No. <laughs> Sick burn. Thank you. Nice. All right, moving on. I have no president's report, so I will move on to public comment on the fiscal items presented for a vote. Okay, no public comment. Then I will need a motion to approve the bills list for Boucher and James, December 2019. So moved. Second. That's Mr. Reimers and Mr. Akmanowitz. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. One abstention, Mr. Jackson. All right, we're going to move on to the fiscal consent agenda. On the agenda, we have um, approved the bills list for December 2019, approved treasurer's report for December 2019, approved budget transfers for December 2019, levy transportation addendum. This is the one um, that we were discussing earlier. Can I get a motion to approve the fiscal consent agenda? I'll second it. Was that you, Mr. Micucci? And then did Mr. Anderson a uh, second? Discussion? I just had a question. Is there a place where we can look at the uh, what we're spending for this bills list? It's I mean I no, I know oh. I know there's a probably two hundred item readout on there, but I don't know what all of those expenses are exactly for. I know what it says, but it just says, you know, fifty dollars to, you know, Ted or something like that. But is there somewhere where we can look and say like a oh, category or yeah, something like this money went because to serve this need or, or whatever it is Maybe if we had category codes that, that might sense. be helpful. Did I ask that? Well, I don't think I did So I came in if I may uh, I came in like two months ago, and I'm like What are all these Amazon bills we're paying like so I had them pull for me phone bills and Amazon bills and just based on my request they did um, I think that if something uh, strikes your fancy that you want to see further information on, I think all you have to necessarily do is ask Zach, and he will give you access to that information, if I'm correct. I just wondered if there was a, you know, somewhere deeper that I could look and say, oh, okay, this Amazon bill is for this, for example. Is there any way to that point that we could get a category code assigned to them, or is that difficult to do? We can look into adding a more detailed budget code, but it's not going to tell you specifically what it was used for, because you'd actually need to look at the various invoices um, to know exactly what it was. Um, what, what, what Mr. Akmanowitz said is probably the best solution for a couple of reasons. One is they do thousands of bills a month. I might be a little high, but and if you've been here long enough, you'll realize that 99.9% .9 of them are routine for normal everyday expenses. No, and I understand you're saying you're, you you got valid concerns. Is certainly if you want, you can have. But rather than changing the format of the agenda, I would say it it's better for you to contact Zach or somebody directly and get, if you want them all, he can give them to you all. I just think that on the agenda, it's a little much. See if you can, see if, look into the code. Maybe we can, that'll be, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. It's coming in, coming in as a new board member, I can tell you. You got a lot of questions, ask away. Yeah, Zach. You got you to gotta learn somehow. Yeah, the crazy part is we did the same thing. <laughs> we did the same thing. No, <laughs> we did. What's the, what's the, the reason yeah. I asked. $100 for the box of pencils. Right. Yeah. Like, right. The reason I asked about uh, my first year teaching in Allentown, I had a student who we were teaching computers, and all of a sudden the principal's there with these three, uh, I'll say, you know, Nintendo games. And I said, well, what are you doing here with them at, at my door in my classroom? And she said, well, someone here ordered them. What do you mean someone ordered them? She said the order went out two days ago from this room, from this IEP, uh, IP address, 
who ordered these these video games? I said, I have no idea. And here a sixth grader had ordered them through the uh, thing. They got approved for a, for a purchase. And I'm not saying that's happening here. It was just a thing. And it just got me curious why we're yeah. <laughs> I still have them today, actually. Um, no, I don't. Uh, why we have 200 items. And I just was curious on what we were spending 200 or $7 million on these 200 items and what that money was going toward. No, it's a good comment. I mean, another quick story. I'll, I, in the IU bills list one day, I saw like hundreds of $35, $25, to, to people, just names, one after the other, right. after another. And it turns out that they actually, the funding was there. They paid the parents to drive the kids to Head Start. They actually, really? they, yeah, just the, the drive to and back, they got reimbursed for their travel. I did have one question on here. Sure. There's um, uh, a Zeswitz bill for, well, three items, about $69,000. Didn't know exactly what those were. It is music. I don't have it in front of me. Is it part of the bid from before? Okay. So the music department has continually requested new instruments, and at the direction of the board last year, I have been purchasing them for them. So I could get you exactly what the instruments in this were, but they were all previously um, sent out for bid and, and published on our website and through the board and then um, purchased through the lowest bidder, which in this case was said what says what's lowest responsible bidder. Was it literally For three instruments, instruments or was it three line items of instruments? Three line it items. should be three line items. There were multiple instruments in each thing. So like for instance, if they requested seven tubas, it would only say tuba on there, but then it would be multiplied out for the final bill. I, mean, I just don't have the... Ultimately, the reason I'm asking is because so since the board never really approved the strings program in the past, this would be the time when the board could would actually approve it if they were approving to purchase string instruments. Correct. I have not asked the board for any money for any stringed instruments, as I promised in the presentation about um, about the program. Okay, I didn't know if this was for next year then. And this is this strictly the for time. instrumental music, um, sixth grade center, um, Strayer, instruments and I believe there might still be one elementary last year we took care of almost all the elementary instru music, instrumental musical I think there still may be in this one it's actually remember there still might be an elementary school that was getting tubas I, I have looked at so many tubas that I forgive me I can't remember <laughs> where they're going I never knew so uh, much sure. about euphoniums and the middle schools and elementary schools tended to get all the leftovers from the high school so it's good to see them actually getting new instruments so hundred thousand dollars worth so far chris yeah three hundred thousand for the middle school yeah we sure do invest into our music program that's why they are awesome They're good yeah. <laughs> all right um moving on oh i'm sorry uh I, we already did I, I got carried away with the discussion all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. aye. opposed Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the facilities consent agenda, we have, um, I need to get a motion to approve the contract with, oh, I'm sorry, um, thank you. Is there any public comment on the facilities consent agenda before we move to a vote for that? All right, I need a uh, motion to approve the contract with Lions Recreation for Nidic Elementary School Playground Equipment. So moved. Mrs. Weed, Mr. Reimer, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Discussion. Um, discussion. <laughs> Dang it, I thought I was going to get do it this time without messing that. Discussion? You don't like the pictures? No. <laughs> that's pretty cool. We saw I these back in. Neat. Yeah. Saw these back when I was on the facilities committee. I really like them. Yep. From from what I gathered from the meeting too, it's all within budget or slightly above budget, but still not taking anything away from the contingency plan. You know, the extra money that was set aside. Is that right, Zach? Correct. We have line items for uh, all these. Um, 
different FF&Es. Uh, I believe this one is slightly over that line item, but we looked at removing funds from the technology line item, so it was a net zero. We're within budget, Keith. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Keith, they won't save that money. They'll Can use it somewhere. <laughs> all right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Public comment on the human resources items presented for a vote. No public comment? All right, the human resources consent agenda includes professional staff, support staff, and substitutes. And can I get a motion to vote on the human resources consent agenda? So moved. Mr. Akmanowitz? Second. Second. Mrs. Weed? Discussion? I'd like to call out one of our resignations tonight. It's very sad to learn that uh, Michael Peters, a science teacher at the high school, has resigned. And uh, or giving us notice that he's going to re retire. Reti retire. Like I guess. Retired. But I look at him, and he's half my age, so he, retiring is a tough word to use. <laughs> um, but he has retirement. <laughs> okay. Well, mo moving on, I'm probably teaching in another state somewhere. But I, it's just sad. He is. Uh, I've known him for six years. He's been a swim coach, it's a, a good to science teacher for us, and just wanted to call that out tonight. Thank you. All right, um, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? A motion carries unanimously. Public comment on Office of Teaching and Learning items presented for a vote. All right, we have on the agenda the approval of textbooks. Looks like 6th, 7th, 8th grade science textbooks. None of these textbooks decline that climate change is real, right? <laughs> Making sure. They're science textbooks, <laughs> right? Okay, yeah. That's, that's what we're going for. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, can I get a motion to vote on the Office of Teaching and Learning Consent Agenda? Mr. Akmanowitz? I'll second. Mr. Reimers? Discussion? Uh, Ms. Hoffman, is it absolutely necessary that it be voted on tonight? Because I just got them yesterday, which is my fault, but I didn't get to look through them, so I don't know. A motion to defer, right? I didn't. I was asking the question first. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, so we we do tend to try to bring them to the board early enough that we have an opportunity to provide professional development to the teachers to use the textbooks and to write the curriculum for the rest of the year. So I would ask that we not defer uh, too much longer. Like for instance, we have a curriculum day on Monday. Uh, I will ask them not to begin working with these books if they're not approved, oh, okay. um, which is All okay. Right. It, that's okay. okay. Um, but I wouldn't want it to go to the next one, if that makes sense. So if we could if it would be possible to vote on it at the next meeting, I would be fine with that, so you have a chance to review them. And I can start. Any of them? I know you woke up the box yesterday. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I will. Okay. And just for your information, the FOSS kits are just the next generation of the FOSS kits that we've used before, so you won't see um, probably textbooks for those in there. Um, and then just as a reminder, all of these are part of our um, goal area with the curriculum cycle. 4, 6, and 12. So we can certainly uh, we can certainly wait until February if that's okay. helpful All right, to you. Okay. So I move that we delay or table, table this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sure, go. He go needs ahead. a second. Um, Superintendent asked me if you could approve them subject to Mitch's review that if he finds one objectionable would come back at the next meeting. That way, you if, it, if he's fine with it, you can just move on. He needs a second first. Because Monday is our Monday is your staff development day. When is it? Monday. Monday. If you can get through it on the weekend, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
subject to the fact that the, if Mr. Anderson finds any of the textbooks objectionable during his review, that will be removed from the approval and brought back at your next meeting. Motion for what he said. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> oh, well. You're making a motion. You're motioning. Okay, Mr. Anderson, then can I get a second? I think I'll Anderson second it. We are. We are. We're Isn't doing it subject to. I can't do it twice. Like Mr. Carton, does that mean that he would only we would oh. only have to review the one that he? If he finds they're all acceptable, we wouldn't even see them. But if you, that's only that one, but the others would be okay then. Or more. Than it, one. Historically, we have had books rejected, and we'd had the teachers come back and with other recommendations. Yeah. Okay. All on, uh, any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Any public comment on the policies and program items presented for a vote? Okay, our policy and programs consent agenda includes the approval settlement, settlement agreement and release for student 22826, approve the waiver agreement for student 17309, approve the settlement agreement and release for student 19787. So moved. Second. Mr. Akwanowitz and Mrs. Weed. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, any board comment for new business? I, I just wanted to share my sentiment about how delighted I was about the day of service uh, that happened on Monday. Uh, I didn't prepare any words, but I just wanted to send my gratitude to everybody who was involved in the organiz organizing uh, of these events. And I also uh, look forward to uh, the future year's uh, days of service. I'm glad that it's something that we've implemented, and I'm proud of everybody. So thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you sir. I, on behalf of everybody who participated and those who organized it, um, I'll pass on your kudos, and I'll talk about it a little bit in my next blog. I stopped by uh, Bethany Fuller, who was our person in charge this year who put it together. I stopped by her classroom first thing Tuesday morning and thanked her for all the things that went on the day before. And I think we had students participating in, in programs up at Lafayette College on Saturday and some other places. So it was, it's a growing program, and I think as students from uh, elementary school through high school are learning a lot and we're getting a lot of great support from our teachers and uh, staff members up here in the district office and other places. Um, I, I also want to add my sentiment of uh, the two presenters from the last two years. They've both absolutely been phenomenal. They were both absolutely phenomenal and I'd, I'd hope that we'd keep Ms. Jackson on speed dial just in case because she is just a engaging and wonderful speaker, in my opinion. Yeah, um, just for your information, she is on speed dial. <laughs> She's coming back here on, for our staff development day on the 24th, 27th of April to do a uh, program at the high school. And I think others, she came and she spoke in the fall and she talked to almost, I think, to every staff member and a teacher in the fall during our fall in service for the entire morning. And she had everyone um, riveted eyes. And she's an excellent speaker. Her office or her business her LLC has been employed. They come in and they offer parent programs throughout the school year this year. Um, anything else you want to say about that, Janet, since you're the person? From Dr. Jackson? Um, sorry. Okay, it's okay. We're good. <laughs> all right. It's all right. No worries. No worries. All right. Um, let's see. Any other board new business? All right, we have our general public comment. This is our final public comment. Anyone would like to give a public comment? <coughs> Almost beer time, three minutes off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have uh, dates for board member calendars. February 6th, we have a facilities committee meeting, and that's in conference room three. 
February 26th will be a finance committee meeting, same room. March 5th, facilities committee, committee same room. And then March 26th, finance committee, education and curriculum meeting. Uh, finance will be in room three, education and curriculum meeting in room A. And then we'll have a board meeting that same day. Now, before I get to adjournment, I got to know, what team are you pulling for for the Super Bowl? Really? Kansas City. Mm. Andy Reid. Kansas City? What up? I yep. second that. <laughs> oh. I don't know it's baseball season now. No, no Niners people out here? I'll do a plug for the technical school that if you're looking for catering for your Super Bowl ah. party, there are some flyers and we can get you a copy. They are this year um, at the technical school doing a catering option for wings and meatballs and some other items that you can pick up on Friday and serve to your family. Very good idea. I don't think that Kansas City will win, but, you, could eat some wings. you know. Mm-hmm. I'm not, not, I don't care who wins, really. The menu is available on the website, too. So if you don't get one this evening, check the website. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Mr. Akmano went second. 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 Mr. Jackson, discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Good night, everybody. Good evening. Thank you.